My name is LaShawn Thomas. I am currently a television animation producer and director. You know, that's my passion. Thomas currently lives in Japan, has been a pioneer in the TV animation business, having worked with prestigious companies like Disney, Warner Brothers, and Netflix. There's no doubt Thomas is a talent in the industry, but what really makes him special is the journey he took to get to where he's at today. I'm from the South Bronx, New York City, you know, born and raised 152nd between 10 and Union Avenue. I was born in 75, so I grew up, you know, when hip hop grew up in the South Bronx, you know, I was getting exposed to not only the music culture, but, you know, the animation culture, you know, the illustration culture. I mean, for me as a kid, I always wanted to be a comic book illustrator. I think that was my biggest attraction. You know, growing up in my neighborhood, they were just available. You can get comic books, you know, at the bodegas. You can get comic books at the newspaper stands. And I just love storytelling and I love drawing. And I think that became my passion as a young kid, you know, growing up, wanting to be a, a comic book illustrator. And I think that's kind of how it started for me. Though having been enrolled in the arts program at Julia Richmond High School, Thomas never attended college for animation. Everything that I learned um, was, was, was shown to me by by college graduates, people who had already gone to art school and, were, and had degrees, and they would share their information with me. And I was just able to be surrounded by several different mentors and just sponge from them what I thought was needed for, for my voice and use that as the tool to develop my identity as an artist. My big opportunity wasn't actually in an animation gig. I was an unpaid intern at a children's accessories design company. It was just an office job that I did, you know, to put on my resume while I was trying to work to become a professional illustrator. That job turned into a full-time gig and I wound up being hired to be in-house as an assistant designer at that job. And it was because of that job that I landed an opportunity to freelance for a couple of web cartoons. And that was sort of my first foray away from illustration and slowly into animation. This led to Thomas landing an assistant gig at a New York animation studio that produced comedy shorts for SNL, and the animated bits on the television show, Lizzie McGuire. I was an assistant animator on that show, I think for about a year, year and a half. And then I branched off into freelance uh, storyboarding work for different projects, and then jumped into studio production work uh, in Hollywood at Sony Animation uh, with the Boondocks. Riley, let the chain go. Doug Niffis, who wants it back, he can handle it. Then he'll think I'm a punk and kick me out the crew. Season one, I was a supervising character designer and a co-director, and I was supervising character designer on season two. So that's my first, like, big, big popular TV series that I uh, worked on. The Boondocks was sort of like the next man up. That was the next generation of, you know, whatever you want to call, quote unquote, black creativity at the television animation level. You know, and we hadn't had a big show like that for black creatives in a while. And after that show had wrapped up, I wanted to get more experience in other studios, which didn't create black shows. Wanting to further his career and skill set, Thomas sought out a way to become more involved in the animation process. We only handle pre-production in the States, and then we ship all of that stuff to a studio in South Korea, and they handle the bulk of the actual animating. I wanted to be involved in the whole thing, so I uh, spoke to a colleague at the time who had connections to South Korean animation studios that were handling a lot of the outsourcing for Warner Brothers uh, animated shows, and I pitched her my idea of moving to South Korea and working in the house as an artist, and she was like, you're crazy, <laughs> but cool, you know? And I, in turn, used that opportunity to build more relationships not only with animators and producers of studios in South Korea, but also get a sort of close hands-on uh, experience with the uh, outsourcing process. Thomas became one of the first Americans to earn a full-time in-house position in a Korean animation studio. It was, it was challenging for me because at that time, I was only concerned about getting to South Korea. I hadn't thought about how to live there, you know, the fact that I didn't speak the language very well. So I was just like trying to find my identity in a studio full of South Korean talents. I was full time, you know, I worked 12, 13 hours a day and I only had Sundays off, you know, so it was, it was a lot of hard work. I, I never really encountered any racism or any difficulties because of my skin color in particular. Actually, in my opinion, I'd say it was the opposite. I think a lot of the staff at that South Korean animation studio had never had conversations with a black man, much let, let alone uh, work alongside them. 
While in Korea, Thomas found himself assisting an American animated TV show, Black Dynamite, which briefly brought him back to Hollywood. This led to him creating a Japanese-produced anime short in Japan, adapted from his comic book Cannon Busters, which features multiple black characters. The pilot was picked up by Netflix with the help of several international investors as an original series. I think the biggest obstacle I've faced in my career so far is trying to normalize blackness in popular media with the types of stories that I've always wanted to tell. I think a lot of black creatives in the industry currently can relate to that. That has been the most difficult aspect of my creative voice in this business, but not anymore. With streaming, they're not making money from advertising it, and that's the beauty of Netflix. It allows guys like me to not have to squeeze in, you know, a black-led action samurai show for kids. I can just make it as it is, you know what I mean? Because there's a market for it in Japan. It's, it's not just a cultural thing, but it's a business landscape thing too as well. And I think it's incredibly important that we can create an opportunity to allow new voices in the industry, you know, black people in particular, to tell stories that expand upon our idea of what we think is the black experience. We don't all experience blackness the same way. Everybody's voices need to be represented. After building a creative relationship with Netflix, they came back to Thomas and gave him a green light to create and direct a black-led show about a black samurai that will be voiced by actor Lakeith Stanfield in music production by Grammy-nominated music talent Flying Lotus. The project is called Yasuke, and it's actually the name of a figure in Japanese history who served the Lord Oda Nobunaga, one of the three unifiers of Japan for the end of the Sengoku era during the last years of his life. The theory is that he's from Mozambique. He was an African who made his way to Japan through the, uh, the Namban trade. Lakeith Stanfield was the, I think, the first guy in the first meeting with us. He showed up to Netflix with a katana and everything, <laughs> just like his character in Atlanta. It was hysterical. I'm excited. I'm excited to see you know what people think, and um, definitely excited to attract new fans. This is not an easy lifestyle. It's very, very challenging. It's also rewarding, but you have to find your voice. And I think once you find your voice and you know exactly who you are and what you want to create, everything else just falls into place. And then the struggle was worth it.